Mark Huertas company. And uh, yeah, thank okay. you. Hello, so thank you very much. Um, so before uh, going to the main topic, and since we had this beautiful introduction by these two distinguished astronomers that spoke before me, I will spend my first minutes of, the, of my talk um, trying to convince you that we are facing a beautiful challenge, uh, which I like to call the big data revolution in astronomy. And uh, what I'm showing here is this, this is a, a plot by, uh, that I borrowed to Jarle Brinsman. This is the total area, deep area surveyed at high resolution in imaging uh, from the launch of HST, basically, uh, with the different cameras. You can see different cameras showing up. And what I'll show you now is an animation showing what will happen in the next 10 years when surveys like Euclid will be on sky. And this is what will happen. Uh, <coughs> so it continues going on. This is the area in degrees. And <coughs> so uh, you see what happens. <laughs> uh, and this is why I call this a big data revolution, uh, because uh, it stopped 2025. So in 10 years from now, you see the gain in order of magnitude of area deep at high resolution, spatial resolution observed. And in terms of objects, uh, this is a couple of orders of magnitude, more or less, depending on what you select on, and, uh, on, the, on the surface brightness, blah, blah. But it's, it's a huge amount of, of objects. This is imaging, but similar is observing spectroscopy. This is the gain uh, Euclid, for example, but there are other surveys like W first, uh, you will have in spectroscopy. So either faced to this revolution, you can uh, adopt this approach that we heard yesterday, sometimes too much is too much, and then uh, you take just a subsample, or, there you, or otherwise you can take this as an opportunity uh, to look at the data in a different way and try to uh, introduce new techniques to deal with this data and maybe uh, uh, found, find new things. And good things, uh, good news is um, that this big data revolution is not only happening in astronomy, sorry, this uh, thing doesn't work, but anyway, but it's coming. Uh, <clears throat> this big data revolution is not only happening in astronomy, but in many other fields, and therefore, beautiful solutions, namely invoking advanced artificial intelligence, are kicking in. And you probably have heard about this uh, kind of revolution also happening in, in artificial intelligence, which is deep learning. Uh, we heard a few months ago uh, the first machine winning a Go competition, and uh, we are building now very advanced, uh, advanced machines that can be used for astronomy and can maybe uh, find subtle ways of looking at this big amount of data and find things that is not so easy to find with a human brain. This is uh, a deep learning uh, network, learning how to separate uh, different manuscript numbers. So if you apply this to galaxy morphology, which is one of my favorite topics, uh, what happens is that uh, you apply deep learning, this is the, uh, you get a perfect agreement between a visual classification, this is a visual classification from candles in different morphological types, and what you get from a machine. So the a perfect agreement means 100% is the diagonal here, and you see that you get a 97, 90% agreement in visual morphology. Well, it's just an example of what you can do. This is, uh, and if you compare this with state of the art before deep learning, for example, you get something like 70% agreement. This does not mean that you are getting the truth, it's just uh, you are reproducing, it's just to illustrate how you can reproduce uh, the human brain. Now, uh, for some of you who probably don't like visual morphologies, just this is a pre very preliminary uh, test in which we are uh, looking at if we can, for example, gal fit using deep learning. So instead of fitting galaxies using gal fit, which takes a lot of time, can we, for example, train a machine with a lot of simulated objects? You simulate CERSIC profiles, you add PSF uh, convolution, you add noise from HST, and you let the machine learn how to extract CERSIC index, half-light sizes, deconvolved, and magnitudes. And this is how it works in the simulations. So this is what you put in and what you put out, including noise and everything. So you see that we recover very well the CERSIC index, the size, and the magnitude in the simulate. These are, of course, simulated profiles. If you apply this to real HST data, this is far from being perfect yet, but you can see that you can measure with deep learning magnitudes. This is gal fit magnitudes here, gal fit sizes from real galaxies, trained on this here, and this is what you get from deep learning. So you get the size rather well, you get the magnitude. Of course, there are objects that fail, but because they are companions, and these simulations are very simplistic. Now, 
good thing here is that you can feed all candles in less than a second, few seconds maybe, uh, with this thing, while gal feed can take several uh, hours. Now, okay, so uh, to illustrate, so now I'm moving on a bit to the science I wanted to show here. So using this deep learning, uh, we put, toge uh, put together a catalog last year on uh, all candle fields, 50,000 galaxies, with detailed uh, kind of visual-like morphologies. So this is how it looks like. And you see that the deep learning stuff can, for example, identify objects that are not galaxies quickly. And so you have a complete M uh, catalog at 10 to the 10 solar masses of different morphologies. And things that you can do with this is start playing and getting uh, how the structure and the morphology evolves with time and correlates with the star formation. Uh, since you have now uh, optical rest frame morphologies all the way to redshift 3. Now, so what we started doing here is uh, sorry, for, uh, separating galaxies in detailed morphologies. So guys which go from very regular uh, disks in the rest frame uh, to guys which are very spheroidal with no sign of a disk, and then two types of uh, disky galaxies, one with a proeminent bulge and ones with no sign or uh, low uh, bulge to total ratios. So this is based on the deep learning classification, but if you look at the physical properties of these galaxies in different planes that you more parametric, you see, for example, that uh, uh, the effective mass density as compared to stellar mass, you see a beautiful gradient from these morphologies. You have these spheroid guys are more dense. Um, and as far as you go, so these are intermediate. They have, are dense, but they have a disk component. And as far as you go to later types, they go down over here. And you see, however, that uh, or you see also a difference in the axis ratio, so these guys are always very round, while these guys, even if they have a high Xerxic index, above three, because they have a bulge over here, they are uh, a disk-like profile. So these guys have a big bulge, but a disk. These guys don't have a disk that's very roundish. Uh, so, <coughs> and this morphology also correlates with the bulge to total disk ratio in stellar mass, not in light. And you see that the bulge, what are selected as bulge dominated, are basically uh, bulge dominated also uh, in terms of parametric bulge to disk decomposition and the disk a very low bulge to total. Now this is an example of what is selected as spheroids as a function of redshift and as a function of, of, of stellar mass and you see that more or less they look as spheroids. So you can start looking at how the abundances of these different morphologies change over time and these are uh, stellar mass functions um, of a uh, different redshift of all the population, so uh, from redshift 0.5 to redshift uh, 3. And you see, <coughs> so this is a lot of information, all the time the colors are the different morphologies I'm showing here. And you see classical trends, so that our high mass N is dominated by early type galaxies. Um, and you, you look at different redshifts, you see all uh, an evolution, an expected evolution. Uh, at 10.5, for example, focus at 10.5 stellar mass, a typical M star galaxy. You see that if you look at in the nearby universe, uh, it's basically distributed equally between these three morphologies. As far as you start going at high redshift, you are completely dominated by these irregular guys. And also, you have uh, these compact objects that are a significant fraction uh, among 30% of the population. While these normal disk galaxies have completely disappeared and only appear around redshift one-ish. So this is, for example, how Typical M star galaxies look in terms of morphology. So you see here you have a population of very compact objects and very regular objects, and the disk population starts to emerge between redshift 2 and redshift uh, 0. You can look also at this and now in, at, at fixed morphology, right? So you can uh, stack the different mass functions, the different morphologies, and this is. The black line is what is obtained uh, in a completely independent study uh, using the gamma survey. And you see how well it matches uh, our uh, uh, mass functions at redshift zero. And you immediately see also that, uh, for example, the spheroids population here from redshift two doesn't change much at the stellar mass at, uh, in number density at these uh, 10.5 stellar masses, while the disky population show a dramatic increase in abundance uh, at all redshifts. Uh, now you can, with this le learning stuff, you can also play the game since we have uh, dynamic simulations that can produce mock uh, galaxies. You can also play the game of uh, feeding with a machine trained on the observations 
feeding a numerical simulation uh, that is mocking the, the, the HST observations and uh, to see what are you getting exactly in physical properties on the objects that are you selecting on the images. And you see that basically what you select as spheroids from the simulations are objects that are dominated by the velocity dispersion and objects that you select as this key from the uh, observation, so from the simulations and train on the observations are basically rotating this. Now, so you can say uh, what happens to the abundances and in fact the simulation completely fail in uh, getting the, the right abundance of these spheroidal galaxies, for example. This is the, uh, the abundance a fraction as a function of mass for a given redshift beam of what is observed for spheroidal galaxies and this is what the old simulations, the horizon simulation uh, gives you. So uh, this is uh, so it gets the right trend, but uh, m much less in the in normalization. This is probably since in this simulation, these guys are basically formed through major mergers. And this is telling you that something else is needed to match the numbers you observe in the observations. But this is very, very preliminary. Now we are now uh, trying to train this deep learning in getting uh, mergers and pre precisely see if we can identify what, what fraction of these objects are in fact uh, created through mergers and put constraints on this. And you can then try to look at the morphologies, but now distinguishing galaxies that are in the main sequence of star formations or galaxies that are uh, quenched. And if you look at the main sequence uh, galaxies, you see that it is the stellar density integrated uh, all the way to down above 10 to the 8. And you see again the different morphologies and how it changes. Uh, with time, and you see that you are completely dominated here in fraction for the star forming population by the irregular galaxies. And as far as you go at later times, uh, you cross over this, uh, the, the, the normal disks take over without bulge, and uh, the, the stellar mass density of the star forming main sequence galaxy is dominated by these guys here. Now, if you take into account that this is clear, uh, these are all star-forming galaxies, the fact that the stellar mass density is decreasing is a clear evidence of morphological transformation, but you cannot have a decrease of stellar density. So uh, these guys are necessarily transforming, and you see it here in the stellar uh, mass function of star-forming irregulars, how at the high mass end, the uh, abundance is decreasing, and you need to transform them in some way in uh, these objects here. So objects that lie in the main sequence are getting less disturbed and somehow uh, being converted into normal disks but without building a big bulge, right? So they are, it's a kind of smooth transition here. And um, you see here so that this steep evolution that you have here is probably a combination of in situ star formation within these disks but also a contribution of galaxies that kick in over here. Um, and this is... Uh, transformation mainly happening smoothly without interruption of star formation because if you look at the quench fraction of these morphological types at all times, it's always below 10%. Of course, this doesn't mean that this is uh, a straight path. It's just a statistical uh, way of looking at this. And uh, this, what happens then with, uh, you find objects with tensile star formation suppression, as Sandro showed us, and uh, you find that uh, within the star forming population above a 10 to 11 solar masses, you see that you have a fraction of, big, of galaxies with big bulges uh, that uh, uh, represent 40%, 20 to 20, 40%. So these guys could be the guys which are uh, suppressing star formation from the center uh, and, and building a bulge, but they are only 20, 40%. They are still quite a lot of massive galaxies with no bulge. And, continue to start performing stars. Now, <coughs> what happens to the quiescent population? Now, again, I'm showing here you the stellar mass density uh, in fraction, and you see that, uh, as expected, the morphological distribution of the quench changes completely and is dominated uh, by these spheroidal galaxies and uh, by uh, these galaxies with a big bulge and a disk. So basically all the question population have bulges, which is nothing new. But what you see here is that you have these two fo uh, population of galaxies and the evolution is quite different. So again, I remind you that these galaxies are objects with high Schwarzschild index, very round and uh, compact at high redshift. 
uh, while these guys are disky uh, with less, slightly less uh, search index. And what you see here is that while these guys uh, are dominant at high redshift, the number density remains more or less constant above here, at, uh, while these guys over here increase in number density a lot. So now you can say, <coughs> are these different ways of creating these objects? You can, for example, imagine that these guys here, which don't have a disk around and are very compact, could be the result of the formation of a violent formation, maybe through mergers, or as we saw by Abishai talk, while these guys here could be a more gentle quenching in which the disk is not destroyed, or uh, uh, strang uh, by strangulation or morphological quenching, or you can have also a combination of both in which these guys build a bulge and then rebuild the disk again and then gentle quench. But this is just a, a speculation that you can have a different origin for this kind of population. Now, if you, if you think in these terms, you see now, for example, if you look at the number density of these two kinds of objects, so the quiescent spheroids and the quiescent disk spheroid population at a stellar mass of 10.5 where mass quenching or is, is kind of efficient, you see that the number densities change, evolution is completely different. So these guys dominate over here, in which you can say that, in that there's a phase here, redshift 2.5, in the, where this violent quenching is very efficient, and you create a lot of these uh, small objects, uh, while uh, at later times, these, uh, mostly of the newly quenched galaxies look like this, at this stellar mass. Okay, so they have a disk, and you end up at redshift zero with an equal distribution of both with a different uh, number density evolution. This is just what is observed. Uh, <coughs> now, what happens since, sorry, so since these guys are kind of evolving uh, at constant number density, right, you can follow what happens uh, without being too much affected by progenitor bias and see what is happening to these objects that are very compact here and are already quenched. And what you see is that uh, you see a very strong size growth on average happening. So these guys form very compact, they already quenched. And remember, it's a fixed number density, so they start increasing rapidly uh, their size uh, below redshift 0.5. They start with a search index 4, uh, uh, well, it's fluctuating here, but slightly increasing their search index, and they remain always uh, very round. And so what happens to these objects over here uh, is this uh, bulge. So how do you create this disky bulgy uh, uh, system squench? Could it be just that uh, they fade or could you have a compaction? You create the bulge, you rebuild the disk, you rejuvenate, and then you progressively quench. Uh, this, uh, I don't know, but we are trying to do detailed uh, bulge, multi-wavelength bulge to these decompositions of the different systems to get uh, 32 points SEDs of the central parts unconvolved and uh, the outer parts uh, over here and to trying to assess how, uh, the, the, what, the, how the, what are the properties of the central parts and if the, the star formation is in fact these central parts are older or uh, younger than the outer parts. And so finally I will move to what happens at lower stellar masses. So lower stellar masses are thought to be, uh, so you look at the, at the mass function of these quenched galaxies, uh, you see that must, uh, at, lower, at lower redshift, below redshift uh, 0.8 or so, most of the evolution is happening at lower stellar masses, and this is usually invoked as environmental quenching. And it's thought to be satellites being quenched because of the environment. So you can look at the, what happens to the morphologies of these objects, how do they look like. And in fact, you see that uh, this uh, turn up here that you see in the global mass functions, which is usually to, uh, referred as environmental quenching, in fact, is driven by, again, uh, small, uh, low mass, roundish objects. So, uh, and this is what is dominating this turn up here, okay, at low redshift. So, I don't know what happens to these guys. Again, it's a very uh, speculative uh, hypothesis, but and somehow you end up with a compact uh, thing. And if you think they are satellites, maybe they can, be, they can have been stripped or something like that. This is just an hypothesis. But in any case, it seems that what is dominating this turn over here is uh, these objects over here. OK, 
Okay, so I summarize uh, all this by saying that by looking at the morphologies, it looks like uh, between Redshift 2 and 3, you have a, an epoch with, of a rapid building of this quenched mass function, and it's completely dominated by uh, these compact objects, um, which uh, seems to form rapidly and then don't evolve much in number density. Disks, normal disks, both start forming and quenched, uh, seem to emerge between Redshift 1 and 2, and could be a quenching that gently preserve the disk or something that is revealed and then slowly fades. And then uh, at later times, the lower mass end of the, uh, the high mass end of the quenched stellar mass function is already built up. And what happens here is that you see an increase of the lower mass end and is dominated again by uh, compact objects or small uh, bulgy objects. And uh, though, so statistically, this seems to be destroyed in this environmentally quenching effect. Again, this is uh, statistic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Yep. So, um, folks can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I. I had, I recall from the analyses of the compact quiescent galaxies at high redshift that they're primarily disk shaped. They're elongated, et cetera, and, and you know, so if you, if you do the, the, the fit of them, then they appear to be a bunch of disks viewed from random viewing angles. And they're concentrated disks, but they're disks nonetheless. And so I guess I don't see, I, and I understand that your deep learning doesn't see it because it's not deconvolving by the PSF and it's, you know, they, they look pretty round, but when you deconvolve it or if you, you do the convolution well, the, with Galfit, et cetera, you see that they're elongated. Well, the, 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 the axis rate I'm showing here in the Cersei index come from Galfit. Okay, so they're deconvolved. So they're pre-selected using the deep learning Fine, stuff. Fine, but, but then, the point is the, these compact quiescent galaxies are, are also disk-shaped. So all of these, so, so basically the, um, this distinction you draw between the different ways of making quiescent galaxies, mm. saying, oh, the different shapes mean different things. It's really not obvious that needs to be true. I suspect that I agree. When, when most quiescent galaxies are formed, uh, they tend to remain uh, mostly disks. Quite concentrated, but still mostly disks. So the velocity dispersion, I mean, they are measured velocity dispersion of these guys, and they are look very high also. So Understood. They're concentrated, but they, okay. they, have, they have disks. They remember that they were disks. But anyway, they are very compact, so do you need to have a process, while the others are a lot more extended. This is more or less the difference. I don't know. This is a question about the late forming spheroid population, mm. which we've just been gone to notice also. Su Zhu Chen mentioned this in her talk, you might right. have noticed. Um, my question is, wh what are they doing nearby? Have you looked into whether Sloan sees them? Are people studying them? What do people say? Do you mean the... Well, let me clarify my question. I, I was ignorant. I thought if, if somebody had asked me, what do you think a typical galaxy is with a stellar mass of, say, 9.2, log M 9.2, what, what does it look like? I guess I would have said M33 or something like that. Mm. But these objects are right there in that same mass, and they're not spirals, and they're extremely frequent. I, I just didn't even know about them. You mean, so... The appearance of objects below 10 to the, see if I understood probably your question, what are the typical 10 to the or morphology of 10 to the 9 solar masses objects in the local universe? Yeah. Uh, so in the local universe, I don't know, but here what I see at low, a low redshift is that in the quench population, this is dominated by small bobby objects that I show. And I think in the Sloan, we also find these kind of objects this, with this morphology. I don't know what do they come from, but they are, it's, there are a lot of objects like this, small and this Any more questions for Mark? Okay, thank you. <laughs>